Lung cancer is a leading cause of cancer deaths, and like all cancers, early detection is key to saving lives. A low-dose screening is what you need to detect lung cancer. It's a screening so easy, quick, and safe. We're going to show you one live just ahead. Good morning. Good morning, it's Monday, August 1st, and I'm Dr. Steve Stites, standing in for Jessica Lovell today. We are in the Dolph C. Simons Jr. Family Broadcast Studio, a lot of words there. Thanks for joining us on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. COVID is not done with this yet. The BA5 variant is dominating the Metro and actually dominating the studio today. Dr. Dana Hawkinson joins us with the COVID count, plus it's World Lung Cancer Day, and the screening guidelines have changed along with the average number of new cases. We have a great panel of experts to explain. They all love, they love all things lungs. I was about to say they lung all things love, but I had that completely <laughs> averted. Pulmonologist Dr. Mario Castro, Vice Chair for Clinical and Translational Research at the Kansas University Medical Center and Critical Care Specialist and Division Director for Pulmonary and Critical Care. Lots of stuff there at the health system. He's a very smart guy. Dr. Joe Man Joe, Dr. Joel Murm is a great friend of mine, pulmonologist, critical care, CF doc. Joel has COVID, and so he is Zooming with us this morning. We're going to talk to him about how that came about. And joining us from Great Bend is, doc, is family medicine physician, Dr. Jonathan Pike. And, of course, we have Doc Hawk here in the Hawk's Nest. And we have you at home. You play a big part in our discussion. Send us your questions for our team of experts. You'll find those links right here on your screen. Lung cancer is the second most common cancer in men and women, second to prostate and breast cancer. The American Cancer Society estimates that there will be more than 230,000 new cases of lung cancer this year. Let's turn to our guests. Doctors, those are really high numbers, but fewer cases than diagnosed last year. Dr. Mermis, why do you think there's a dip in the numbers? And first of all, Joel, how are you feeling? Uh, thanks for asking. Uh, I'm, I'm feeling okay, not too bad. Fortunately, my symptoms are, are pretty mild. Um, as, uh, as obviously you all know, I've been vaccinated and uh, boosted, and uh, as a result, uh, I'm not feeling too bad, just some mild sinus congestion. So. And where, what was uh, your vector? You, said, you told me this morning you thought it was your son, is that right? <laughs> well, every household has a Trojan horse, as they say, so uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm afraid uh, summer camp may I got us, so that happens. But, uh, right, well, we're, we're, we're glad you're feeling well work. enough to be on the program. Sorry you have COVID. <laughs> Hang in there. We'll check in with you sometime this week here and make sure you're doing it right. So talk to us a little bit about the lung cancer numbers. Why do you think cancer cases are going down? Lung cancer cases are down a little bit. Yeah, if you look at the lung cancer, uh, the, the lung cancer uh, rates of diagnosis, really over the last 20 years, they've been uh, slowly declining, uh, which is obviously great news. Uh, a lot of that we believe is probably related to uh, reductions in the percentage of people that are smoking. And uh, as a result, you know, we're seeing less cases uh, of lung cancer. So a lot of preventative measures, uh, getting information out there about how, uh, ways that we can prevent lung cancer seem to be having an impact as the rates are going down an average between one and 2% uh, per year over the last 20 years or so. Good news. And so while those numbers of lung cancer cases appear to have gone down, the guidelines for screening have also changed and are more stringent. The recommended age for screening has dropped from 55 to 50 and for smoking 30 pack years to 20 pack years. So Dr. Burst, tell us a little bit, why are the guidelines a little more aggressive? What's changing there? Yeah, so the, um, the uh, uh, new guidelines have taken into account uh, a recent uh, large <clears throat> meta-analysis that was done that's essentially looking at a combination of a number of different trials. Um, and in this particular analysis, they looked at up to seven uh, randomized controlled trials. And as, as I know you've discussed on this programming before, randomized controlled trials are really the, the standard of how effective is uh, lung cancer screening. Uh, how effective is it at saving lives? And in this analysis of, uh, of seven uh, trials, uh, two, two big ones, one in Europe, one here in the United States, they found that um, roughly one in 320 people uh, need to be screened for lung cancer uh, with the screening technique we're going to talk about here shortly. 
in order to save a life. And that's if you screen for at least six years, a little over six years, you're going to save one life for every 320 or so people uh, that you screen. And it was found that if that age was reduced to 50, and uh, even for those who smoked a little bit less, in, in the pulmonary world, we talk about pack years. A uh, pack year is basically essentially one pack year is smoking one pack of cigarettes for one day every day of the year. That would be one pack year. So for people who smoke 20 pack years now, when the guidelines used to be 30, people who smoke a little bit less also qualify with the evidence showing that if we screen a little bit younger population and those who smoked a little bit less, that uh, we're, we're likely to save even more lives is what the, what the cumulative data showed. And thus, the new guidelines reflect that. So, Dr. Castro, when we talk about screening, there are some basic principles of screening about how many do we have to do, what's, what's the complication rate, because you can't screen everybody for everything. So, why this? Well, this is the best tool we have. Um, unfortunately, as we're going to talk about the symptoms of, of lung cancer, they're really not very specific. And so, you need to have a screening tool that works effectively, and this does, and this is really the only screening tool we have, Steve, that will pick up a lung cancer, pick it up at an early stage that we can actually remove that lung cancer and potentially save a life, as Dr. Murmus mentioned. Yeah, because I think chest x-ray, it has to be bigger. And by that point, it may have spread to other organs. Dr. Murmus, sometimes people without a history of smoking can get lung cancer as well. What's that about? Yeah, um, unfortunately, a minority of lung cancer cases can be associated with other exposures. Uh, the number one other exposure, other than smoking, uh, is is radon. And uh, most people have probably heard about radon if you've purchased a home. Your home inspector may have mentioned whether you want to want to have testing for radon. But basically, uh, radon is, is a naturally occurring radioactive gas, which can come from the breakdown of uranium. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's possible that uh, some, some homes and some buildings may have uh, levels of radon gas in certain areas within the home that can leak in the, through the foundation uh, or potentially other areas that can expose uh, people to, to a radioactive substance, which can increase the risk of lung cancer. Fortunately, it's the minority of lung cancers that are associated with things other than smoking, which is something obviously that we can control and prevent. It's believed that 10 to 20,000 uh, cancers, lung cancers in the United States per year are related to, uh, to uh, exposures other than smoking. So roughly 10 to 20 percent or less. Are, the other would be, you know, secondhand smoke would be the other uh, primary exposure, which is also believed to be related to, to uh, lung cancer diagnoses in people who didn't smoke. Yeah, secondhand smoke, bad news. My parents are both smokers. Hopefully that's not going to get me some tea. So, Dr. Castro, the list of symptoms for lung cancer is really long. Chest pain that worsens with coughing, laughing or heavy breathing, coughing up blood, um, cough that doesn't go away, frequent infectious pneumonia, weight loss, loss of appetite, joint pain, bone pain, tiredness, all sorts of stuff. Do I have to need, do I need to wait to get those, for those symptoms to occur to get screened or should I do that a lot sooner? Well, I think that's the, the exciting thing about the availability of low-dose CT is that you don't have to wait for those symptoms because we know when you present with those symptoms, often the cancer is too advanced. In fact, you know, 60 to 70 percent of, of lung cancers when we first detect them are already in advanced stages. And so the, the idea behind low-dose CT is that when you're above 50, and when you're above those 20 pack years, as Dr. Murmurs outlined, um, and this is something you don't have to necessarily calculate, but you can go on Google and Dr. Google can do it for you or your primary care physician can calculate that for you. Yeah, be careful of that Dr. Google stuff. You, know, you may get the wrong calculator on the Dr. Google. <laughs> exactly, then, you know. exactly. Um, but once you meet those criteria, then you can be screened for the uh, lung cancer screening program. and. That really is um, the exciting part because you don't have to wait for those symptoms. I, you know, those symptoms that are mentioned there, we see with pneumonia, we see with chronic bronchitis, we see it with our patients with uh, emphysema and chronic, you know, uh, lung disease. So it's it's not anything very specific to it. And in fact, uh, you know, when you get one of those scary ones like coughing up blood, that really you know brings to your attention. Often again, those, that indicates that the cancer has spread inside the airways and is causing uh, some bleeding. So 
let's not wait till that to that point. If you have a loved one that uh, meets those criteria, greater than age 50, greater than 20 pack years of smoking, get them in uh, to your doctor uh, to do low dose screening. And those new CT scanners are pretty pretty cool because it doesn't take much radiation. It goes super fast. It's not much longer than a chest X-ray. Dr. Christopher Pike is an outstanding family medicine physician in Great Bend. We just got a new low-dose CT scanner. Is getting one soon. What are the risks of low-dose screening? Why is it called low-dose, Chris? Yeah, um, I'm still not the captain of the Enterprise, but um, I look forward to being that one you day. You do look good. I, I'm telling you, have you seen the new show? Strange New Worlds is awesome. Yes. Um, so, yeah, we just got the, the new low-dose CT scanner in, installed last week. And um, we're really excited about the opportunities now because um, as Dr. Marmis and Dr. Castro have alluded to uh, with all of the symptoms, you know, patients probably aren't going to show up or they, they would show up with those symptoms, but people aren't going to show up to the pulmonology clinic and say, hey, I, I think I've smoked 15 pack years or 20 or 30 pack years. Let's get screened. I think that's the, that's the benefit of having primary care physicians involved in the process because that's the, that's the job that we have is the identification part. And so now that we have a CT scan locally that can aid to the um, screening process, um, we're, we're really excited about that. So to answer your question, why is it called low dose screening? It's about a one seventh of the dose of the radiation of a, of a normal CT scan of the chest. And it's about a third of the radiation that we get in background radiation just by being living and breathing on planet Earth. So uh, that makes it a lot safer for the patient. And, and when you compare it to the background and, and the other risk factors and harms of lung cancer screening, um, really it does not add, the, the scan itself is not adding extra risk to the patient. I would say probably some of the risks are, are finding other things that we didn't expect. And so, so what if we're checking for lung cancer and we find something else? And that's some, some of the risks that I would have to go through with the patient as I, as I see if there are candidates for this. And then the other risk, I guess, some people don't wanna know and, and that's their choice. And if they, or if we find something, they wouldn't wanna do anything about it. And so making sure they understand how each path plays out if we screen it and what the treatments would be like or if we screen and find something and they don't and they choose not to treat what that would what that would be so that's where we stand here that's pretty cool and yes i know your full name is dr jonathan pike but that doesn't fit my star trek mug all right <laughs> all right so we've learned the impact of low dose screening for lung cancer as promised we're going to show you how easy it is joining us from the medical pavilion here at the health, at the health system is melissa bullig Supervisor of CT Radiology and patient Bill Lyons. Melissa and Bill, or Melissa, Bill can't talk to us because you've been prepping him for the scan. Walk us through that, including the why and the how there. So Bill is here for a CT scan of his lungs, and um, it's a pretty easy study. Uh, there is no prep for it. The patient just schedules their CT, and they come in, and the test itself takes about three minutes. Um, Bill just has to lay here on the scan. He's going to go in and out of the machine about three times, and then we are done. That's all. And does he have to even have an IV? He does not have to have an IV. No, see, it that's like the best scan. It is all without contrast. Um, the test is very fast. Yes. All right. All right. It's well, a fast let's one. do it. You, let's do it, and please give us the play-by-play -play happening while the while the screening is going on there. I think we could see Melissa getting ready. He's going to go into the scanner, and it's going to be really rapid. And Mario, is it true you could get something the size of a grain? You can find a, a, a grain of sand or something. Yeah, I mean, this is amazing technology. Down to one millimeter, uh, you can detect little nodules. And this part of the, you know, I think as uh, Dr. Pike mentioned, one of the issues about um, CT screening is we find so many other things and we have to kind of monitor those and so that's one of the things that Please physicians like Dr. Pike need to breath. discuss with. 
All right. So then all, the big challenge is you got to hold your breath with the scan. Having had a Start few breathing. CT scans before in my lifetime, I uh, I know that that's it. Take a deep breath and hold it. But that's yeah. what's amazing about this technology now. It's so fast. It's a single breath. Yeah. Breathe so it, it is breath. six seconds. You know, it's literally it just uh, goes like that. You can see how fast the whole day thing's going. Start breathing. Melissa, are you doing, and Bill's doing okay there in the scanner? He is. Excellent. So, um, Dr. Mervison, or Dr. Castro went, tell us the role of this background smoking or, you know, passive smoking, whatever you want to call it. Talk to us a little bit about the role of that in lung cancer. Well, we know, um, either primary smoking, somebody smokes themselves, or being exposed to somebody, secondhand smoke. And hold your breath. Um, that s smoke exposure has a number of carcinogens. Um, and so those activate cells that in your body can turn into lung cancer. Start breathing. And it can start at a very early stage without you knowing about it. And as that grows, then that starts to press on other structures in your body or start to erode and it causes the symptoms that we talked about earlier. But the the problem, Steve, is that this has to get to a size to do that. And what we want to do is detect it with this low-dose scanner, just like Bill's having well done. done there, at that stage where it's just a, you know, less than a centimeter in, in size, so we can then go in there and remove it. The, uh, and, and, and it looks like, Melissa, is Bill done? Bill is all done, it's easy as that. Wow, that was like really done. fast. You're done and free yeah. to go. Great. All right, Bill, thank you for <laughs> being on the, the program. I'll let you grab all your stuff. All right. A lot easier than a colonoscopy. What's that? That's a lot <laughs> easier than colonoscopies. <laughs> and because more fun. More fun. <laughs> yeah, more fun. That's right. And hopefully he's going to get good news from that scan. Jill, uh, I bet we have some questions from our viewers popping up this morning. What do you got? Uh oh. Oh. Bottom line, what does this cost for those without insurance? If we don't know that answer, I'm sure we can find it, but does anyone perhaps know? I don't know that off the top of my head, but we will find out. Most insurance is now covered, I think, though, right? I think Dr. Mermers or Dr. Castro, I think it's mm -hmm. usually covered because it's become standard of care. Um, if you don't have insurance, you want to pay for it on your own, we'll find that and get that to you later this week. I'll be back Wednesday. Let's see if we can get it by then. Okay, we'll do that too. And then Cindy is asking, if a low dose CT scan can be used for anything other than lung cancer? Oh, great question. What do you mm -hmm. think, Dr. Castro? Yeah, so I use it every day. Um, and in fact, I, this is the preferred therapy or preferred imaging technique that's gonna be part of the future. Um, we believe as this technology gets better and better, faster, lower doses of radiation, it will replace the ch plain chest x-ray, which is kind of what we've been working with for a number of centuries, well, not centuries, <laughs> be decades at least. Be careful there, brother. <laughs> I've been working but, for a long time. But, you know, this uh, uh, technology w helps us uh, detect other things. Uh, as mentioned by Dr. Pike at the beginning, I've had patients screening for this and we found out, well, they have pulmonary fibrosis or they have scarring in the lung. And I found uh, that they have um, other conditions like calcification in the coronary arteries, which is a sign that we use for detecting early heart disease. So there are so many other advantages to it. Dr. Castro, our, our doctor, um, I said that, but I meant Mermis. Dr. Mermis, you, you and I use it in cystic fibrosis patients. Sometimes even with airway infections, you can tell patterns of infection. Talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, that's right. And I think it's important to clarify, you know, this, uh, this lung cancer screening program, the, the technology, uh, the software for the CT is very specific for detection of lung cancer. Often when you'll see your doctor in clinic, whether it be your primary care physician or a pulmonologist, uh, for example, they may order a dedicated CT chest looking for something else specific, which is really, I think what we're talking about. <clears throat> Although, as Dr. Castro mentioned, it's not uncommon for us to find other unexpected uh, uh, things or diagnoses on the on the low dose lung cancer screening CT. But yes, for example, other other people with other lung conditions will use this same technology frequently to help uh, better uh, get a better uh, characterization of the severity of their disease, whether their disease is advancing 
uh, over time or whether they're responding to the therapies that we're, we're using, for example, in cystic fibrosis. We often have uh, people on uh, various treatments to help improve their lung disease, improve the chronic lung infection that people with cystic fibrosis uh, suffer from. And CT is a great tool for us to be able to see if those therapies are working as, as we uh, anticipate that they should. Jill, other questions? Yeah, I, first though, I wanna give a shout out to our really amazing web team. They did find an answer. Uh, I know it doesn't speak to the cash, but it says Medicare and many other commercial payers have approved this screening as a covered benefit for those who meet high risk criteria. For those with insurance, we will bill your insurance provider if you need further tests um, it says that the insurance companies will additionally pick up those as well. So it sounds like um, this is a great test to go ahead and get. And then Lisa, I think we may have talked about it, but she was saying, could you go or answer one more time if there are any risks associated with low dose lung screening? You know, the risks are pretty low, Mario, because the background radiation, the, the radiation from this is so much reduced from a standard CT. Yeah, so I, I think Dr. Pike uh, mentioned that about a third of kind of the natural background radiation that you just going outside in the sun, you get, you're getting a little, uh, you know, UV radiation. So um, it's, it's truly uh, gotten that down to the point that this is um, pretty much like almost like getting about 10 chest x-rays, you know, in terms of that radiation exposure. And it's uh, really, I, I think, um, something that you have to weigh with your doctor. We're not gonna do in everybody because it does have some risk involved with it. By the time you meet that eight, those criteria though, 20 pack years of smoking and uh, at least uh, 50 years of age, your risk is much greater at that point than this, ri this really low dose risk of, uh, of using a low dose scanner. And just to say, vaping is not safer than smoking. Correct. All right. For um, many reasons. Yeah, for many reasons. <laughs> it may be worse in many ways too. Yeah. Jill. Yes, let's take one more and then we have more coming in, but I'll save them because I know some people are interested in the COVID count. But Brian and Brenda are asking, is lung cancer hereditary? Ooh, Dr. Murmuris, I don't think it's necessarily hereditary, although you can have a predisposition or predilection. Yeah, that's right. Um, <clears throat> there, there is, um, you know, definitely some uh, individuals who are diagnosed with lung cancer who don't have any uh, clear exposure risk that we can identify who probably do have some genetic uh, predisposition. Um, although at this point, uh, identifying what that specific predisposition may be and tracking that back in families at this point is, is uh, you know, can be difficult uh, to do. But, but for some uh, rare cases, there may be uh, some genetic predisposition for some individuals. Yeah, but the overwhelming thing is smoking, smoking, yep. and smoking. Dr. Pike, are your patients, are they, are they good with the Lotus CT scanner out there in Great Bend, or how's that going so far? Well, th this, is the, this is the first opportunity that I've been able to discuss with patients that we actually have it now. So for probably about the past six months where I knew we had it slated to get, but this was one of the other many downsides of COVID is is that it pushed back our, our CT scan arrival date, but but looking at the patients that meet the, the screening criteria and, and prepping them to say that this is an opportunity that we have coming soon. And I think just with so many other people suffering from lung cancer and, and them seeing what um, family members or friends have gone through with that, that they are really eager to, to engage in the possibility. And I think one of the other ways that this really helps me on the front lines is is to prompt them for smoking cessation if they haven't quit already and and you know looking at some of the the research and studies people who who are willing to participate in this program have at least a, a 15 percent better smoking cessation rate and, and adherence to that smoking cessation uh, without relapse so so this is going to be a great tool not just from the screening purposes but but from uh, facilitating smoking cessation in, in many of my patients. Well, I like that. That would be that would be great news. All right, it's time to check in with Dr. Dana Hawkinson, Medical Director of Infection Prevention Control, Infectious Disease Physician, yeah. to learn about our COVID count today. Doc Hawk, how we do? Yeah, uh, I think we're still doing good, better uh, better than a couple the last couple weeks. 
Um, certainly we still have uh, quite a few patients in the hospital, 28 active, four in the ICU, two of those on the ventilator, uh, still 16 in that recovery period, Steve, but again, probably down about 10 active infections uh, from where we were, you know, at the beginning of last week and, and that week before that. So I think that hopefully then is a good trend and that's what we've been waiting for is really to look at that seven to 10 day trend. We sure hope that's right. And, and the numbers are down, hopefully the numbers are gonna to continue to go down because across the country, it sort of depends on where, what region yeah, you're in, absolutely. you're seeing some spikes. So we can mm -hmm. pop, pop up that New York Times uh, map, the hotspots. Yeah. You know, the, the, there are a few new hotspots that have emerged around the country and you can see it again, the Southeast, the Southwest, mm -hmm. not so much the Northeast, I think they've had there, but it's in the Midwest and the Ohio Valley area. But um, still a lot of hot spots throughout yeah. the country, and we're still in the red zone here in Johnson, Wyandotte, Jackson, and Clay. Yeah, and it, it, it really is unfortunate. Again, I think we, as a nation, kind of reached our most recent nadir at the end of March. Since that time, we saw a fairly steep curve. If you look at any of the national uh, cases curves, uh, we saw a fairly steep curve, but it seemed to plateau. It's really staying in that plateau, you know, up or down a few percentage points every week. So, but unfortunately, if you look at hospitalizations, that has continued to have a slow increase. And I think that's what we have been seeing. And we certainly saw that and are seeing it here at our health system. So breaking over the weekend, President Biden tests positive again for rebound COVID after yeah. it took us packs low. But yeah. we're seeing that. Yeah, you know, again, I, I don't understand uh, if he had symptoms again or if they were testing him out of precaution. He was asymptomatic and they were testing out of precaution. So, again, I think this sends a confusing uh, message, just as does Dr. Fauci taking that second course of Paxlovid. Again, second ca case of uh, second course of Paxlovin is not in the EUA. Certainly, I'm willing to uh, monitor and and have those clinical trials for longer courses or a second course. But this is just, I think, sends a confusing message. However, we understand President Biden has to meet with people and is all around. This is probably out of a, a, a more precaution than anything. He did go back into isolation. Yes, and you know, it's interesting to note that, it, remember Paxlovid was really looked at most closely in the unvaccinated population. Absolutely. We're using in the vaccinated mm -hmm. population. And I yeah. think appropriately, especially when people are older and have more uh, have yeah. other risk factors. Yep. But the truth is we never really studied it that thoroughly in the. In in yeah. the fully immunized population. Yeah, I think that that is a great point. You know, it, it is really to help reduce your chance of hospitalization and the greatest benefit came from those that were in the study trials that were unvaccinated. Very minimal benefit for those that are vaccinated and up to date. And especially like you said, Steve, I think we always have to consider in, the, in this talk about COVID and hospitalization and death, comorbidities or things such as age because those are vitally important as well. Okay, should, so should anybody get Paxlovid right now or should it just be reserved for those, especially vaccinated, that you maybe have more risks? Yeah, I mean, I think I know with uh, what we know about the bulk of the evidence continues to support the fact that really if you are unvaccinated, if you are otherwise young, say under 50, uh, up to date with your booster, I, I don't really think that the benefit is very good, that there is much benefit of taking Paxlovid. It may help with your symptoms. But again, uh, we have people who really don't want to take medicines. I think this would support the fact that if you are otherwise healthy, up to date with your vaccines and boosters, you have coronavirus, you probably do not need Paxlovid in that situation. Yeah. So there's an immunologist that's warning that a new strain of COVID-19 could be causing different symptoms. Is that BA5? And what, what's this about it emerging at night? Yeah, you know, again, I think this is anecdotal. Um, this is out of the UK. It's hard to really understand and, and digest and tease these things out now with so many people vaccinated. We really need to do a very good study to understand this and look at this. Um, is, are those symptoms due to vaccination in your immune system actually getting kicked into high gear because now you're seeing the virus? We know that people are said to be having symptoms earlier. Most of that is probably because they have been vaccinated. So their immune system is start working. That is what's causing the symptoms. This may be a consequence of that as well. Again, I think it's an interesting observation, but definitely needs more study. So we've learned over the pandemic how devastating COVID can be on our lungs. Mm -hmm. I may be biased, but I think it's pretty clear <laughs> that's one of the yeah. primary organs we have to worry about. I have to ask this panel of experts about their patients, how COVID's impacting them. Dr. Mermis, uh, how about you? You're with our CF patient population or other groups. Have they been affected? You're more, don't forget to unmute there, Joel. There you go. Oh, can you guys hear me? I'm yes, unmuted, sir. but you hear me okay? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Gotcha. Um, sorry about that. All righty. Um, yeah, you know, when, when COVID uh, 
first, uh, when, when the pandemic first started, you know, we were very concerned about, uh, you know, people with CF, a uh, population of people that have pre-existing lung disease, you know, with concern that they would uh, really be at risk. Uh, fortunately, I think two things really benefited uh, that the majority of that patient population. One, as you know, a, a new therapy for CF fortunately became available and was FDA approved in 2019, which really changed the landscape and helped uh, people through this time do so much better with their baseline CF disease, which we really believe has had a profound impact on their ability to to get through a COVID infection to where the majority of people fortunately have done well. The other main advantage is that most people, not all, but most people with CF are pretty young. And as we've seen throughout the pandemic, you know, most young people with without a lot of the risk factors uh, for severe COVID, which we otherwise know of uh, being age being a predominant one, uh, you know, so the, the majority of people have fared well, fortunately, have had mild symptoms. And of course, we've really worked hard to promote vaccination among um, this population to help protect them. Um, even with all of those efforts, uh, you know, like I said, most people have done well, but we have had a few uh, cases uh, where, where people have developed uh, severe symptoms, required hospitalization. Fortunately, that's been a, a small minority of people, but we, we've had some, you know, un unusual cases, uh, the, the, the as expected uh, respiratory failure that, that can occur. Uh, generally, this this occurs in people with advanced, very advanced lung disease or those, as you well know, post lung transplantation who are on immunosuppression and for this reason aren't able to respond to the vaccine as well as as well as someone who's not on immunosuppression and thus puts them in a high risk category. We've also seen people with uh, other uh, manifestations of COVID as 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 have been uh, published, such as uh, issues with throm thrombotic issues uh, or cl or clotting and the complications of, of blood clotting. Some rare uh, uh, instances of that affecting uh, their health. But I, the, the the overall message is that most people with CF fortunately have done well uh, because of vaccination uh, and because of the pre existing advances in the treatment of CF. Uh, we're, we're very, we're very thankful that that uh, was developed just prior to the onset of the pandemic. Yeah, that that was a really lucky thing. So, hey, Dr. Pike, have any of your patients suffered chronic lung disease or damage from COVID that you've been taking care of? Yes, I, I do have a handful of, of patients on my my primary care panel that I, I think most of them were really affected by the Delta strain. That's the one that I've seen anecdotally hit the hardest. And, and those were the people that required, even some young people that required stay in long-term care facilities before they came back to me. The other, not necessarily chronic, but long-term manifestation that, that I've seen also most notably from, from when Delta was surging was, was people that had some pulmonary emboli and blood clots in their lungs and, and following them up for the, the three to six months after that. But those are the, those are the two biggest things. And now, um, we have uh, a fair number of people who are in the by age in the higher risk population that are that are getting Paxlovid, and but I don't see them in the clinic very much. And they, we haven't had any hospitalizations for a while, which we're very grateful for. Yeah, Paxlovid's been a game changer in this disease. Dr. Castro, you've been engaged in research around COVID throughout the pandemic. What might uh, what have you learned that might be of a special note to our audience? Well, I think as we talk about the current state of uh, COVID, we know that um, one of the biggest problems we're going to be facing in the future, Steve, is is really the sequelae. You know, what's going to happen after all these cases of COVID? And, and even with mild cases, we know that you can develop long-term sequelae of that. We call that lawn haulers or lawn COVID. Um, and we're, we're trying to figure out what to do with that. Um, and so we are enrolling patients in a recover trial. Um, there are 17,000 patients to be enrolled in that trial. Over about over half of those patients have been enrolled so far. And in fact, here at KU, we're one of the top enrollers into that study nationwide, which is uh, really nice. We're, we're trying to learn. Um, we're trying to learn what are the appropriate diagnostic tests? What are the syndromes or the cluster of symptoms that we're seeing and what causes that? And then we're starting to set up clinical trials. And in fact, uh, we're hoping to participate in those clinical trials yet this fall. Uh, to try to, uh, to treat that. So 
That's where we're at in terms of understanding um, the long COVID, but I, I, I really think that one thing I, I wanna ask, uh, which Dr. Murmers brought up is, some of these immunosuppressed patients, um, what is the status, Dr. Hawkeye, about uh, the monoclonal antibody? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so currently there is that one monoclonal antibody that we use as therapy. This is therapy for acute infection, bevlutovimab. It seems to still have activity. It is um, alternative therapy. Again, the preferred outpatient therapy is uh, continues to be Paxlovid. We continue to give uh, bevlutovimab to those patients. And again, that's that monoclonal antibody to those patients that could not receive Paxlovid or don't want to get it, who are at high risk of hospitalization. It does continue to protect and have um, uh, uh, effectiveness against BA5 and what we've seen through Omicron and its subvariants. So, so no role in prevention or with transplant patients? No, not for that monoclonal antibody. We do have Evusheld, which mm -hmm. is for patients who are unable to take the vaccine or for patients who you believe will not have an immune response to the vaccine because of um, high risk situations such as chemotherapy or other immune dysfunction that does continue to provide very good uh, protection and prophylaxis against infection as well. And your, and your asthma patients, how are they doing with COVID? Um, they're, they're similar to uh, what Dr. Murmurs mentioned with our CF patients. Uh, they're doing pretty well. We, we know that asthma is a very common disease. When we've looked at patients that ended up in the hospital with COVID, it appears pretty close to what the population risks are. You know, and I know in the lung transplant population that um, the impact of COVID and Omicron in particular and BA5 as part of that have been especially severe. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. that group is not a candidate for um, Paxlovid because of drug-drug interactions. And so you're really left with, hopefully they've been vaccinated, gotten the shelled, which they're supposed to get every six to 12 months. And then um, some of these monoclonal antibodies, remdesivir and other things, if mm -hmm. they come in the hospital. Hey, let's get back to our topic about low-dose scan and detecting cancer. What's gonna happen next in this whole world? How do we treat lung cancer and how has that changed over the recent years, Dr. Mermis? Well, um, I think the main uh, message here is that uh, as is often, as has been the case with many advances in the treatment of specific diseases, this is also true for treatment of lung cancer in that it's become very personalized. Um, and, you know, personalized therapy basically means that we're able to take the total uh, amount of information at the time of diagnosis, that being, you know, what kind of gene mutations specifically are within that, within the, within the cancer that an individual has, and what other factors may be um, relevant, whether they smoked or, or had other exposures, that total amount of information, including the gene mutations that they have within their cancer can be used to then tailor a very specific a therapy for that individual, uh, so-called personalized medicine. And we continue to see advancements in personalized medicine that have dramatically improved the overall uh, mortality rates in, in various cancers, including lung cancer. Dr. Castro, there are a lot of trials out there around yep. lung cancer. What do we have going on now? And are you excited for the treatment of lung cancer? Yeah, I mean, I actually, uh, I was thinking, uh, you know, in my training, if, if I was going into a subspecialty right now, this might be the area because this is really going to change. You know, when we first started a few years ago, Steve, yeah. uh, um, yes, lung, lung cancer was one of those things that was very tough uh, because things weren't improving. Um, but now things are radically changing. Um, there is, um, I'm going to refer you to the KU Cancer Center um, website. If you'd like to participate in a lung cancer trial, there are a number of them going on right now. We have uh, some of the outstanding uh, leaders in the field, Dr. Um, Jun Zane, uh, Dr. Wan, are leading some of our lung cancer trials here. And they're using this, this as Dr. Murmurs mentioned, it's targeted therapy. Um, we've learned a little bit from breast cancer that if you take a little piece of the tissue and you figure out what mutation is inside that tissue, then you can actually target that lung cancer itself with uh, specific therapy. So there have been KRAS mutations that have been targeted as well as other things. We also have immunotherapy uh, that has now been developed for lung cancer. Very exciting because it could potentially, if you have the right type of lung cancer, can really change your outlook in life. Well, but, and I, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yes. <laughs> 
I was going to say, as a person who has lost, or lo I lost my mom when I was very young. I was 19 when she died from lung cancer oh, from sorry. smoking. And uh, this, so this is near and dear to my heart. And yeah. just cancer therapy in general, and lung cancer in specifically, is rapidly evolving. And what a tremendous move forward that is. If you're interested in learning more about that, there's a link up at the top of the screen there that you can grab on that will take you to the uh, cancer center and you can become involved in, uh, if you're interested in, uh, more about that. So Jill, let's see if we have any reporter or community questions out there today. We've got monkeypox, COVID, and low dose mm. CT questions. One that I have for you is you mentioned about your mom. Um, do you get low dose screenings? You know, I haven't yet. I'm listening to the program. I, I'm, I'm a lifelong non-smoker, however, um, pretty adamantly so, actually. And, but I did have a lot of secondary smoke when I was young. So I should ask these guys, should I get a, 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 a cancer screening? Mermis? This is your well, chance I think, to punish me. For the, <laughs> I think, you know, if we were to uh, adhere to the guidelines, which we, we, we generally recommend doing, you would not qualify unless we thought you had, as we discussed earlier, a 20 uh, pack year exposure uh, over the course of your lifetime. And, and then also, I don't know if we uh, discussed this, but also people need to have uh, quit smoking less than 15 years prior uh, to initiating the, the screening. So in your case, I would presume it's been more than more than 15 years. So at this point, you you probably wouldn't qualify. Yeah, you're, you're right. I, I haven't, I've never smoked, so it's been more than 15 years <laughs> since I haven't smoked. So there you go. All right. John wants to know if the Proton Therapy Center that recently opened, if Proton Beam would be used to treat lung cancer. I don't know. I saw that question. I'm not sure I know That's the answer. Question. Do you guys thoughts? Yeah, no, currently proton therapy is not utilized for the treatment of lung cancer, but uh, radiation therapy certainly is and is a, um, can be a life changer. I've had some patients, uh, Steve, that have had pretty advanced lung disease, emphysema, and they can now use those stereotractic, you know, computerized radiation beams to really just target to a very small piece of the, of the lung and treat that part. Um, so it, it, radiation is definitely part of it, but not uh, proton therapy at this point. Good Ying stuff. Lang would like to know, how high is the false positive rate that might cut result from a low-dose CT in detecting lung cancer? Well, that's a good question, mm -hmm. Joel, because really you're trying to look for the mass or you're trying to find that little area that looks a little suspicious, and after that you have to go get a diagnosis. So it's a screening tool. It doesn't actually tell you that you have cancer, so I'm not sure false positive rate. That's a kind of funny question on that. Yeah, yeah it's, a, right. it's a good It's a Sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Go ahead, Joel. Yeah, I was just going to say it's a relevant thing to talk about because we often do have, you know, the, the typical scenario would be that we find a lung nodule, which is a small spot within your lungs. And then we have to determine how, how do we approach that? Do we need to get a biopsy or should we just monitor that with uh, a, a sooner CT scan than the annual low dose CT scan? So, you know, it's important to when we when we talk about this, as Dr. Pike mentioned, to talk to our patients about the fact that it may result you know, and, and potentially a, a biopsy of something that is determined later to be benign or additional CT scanning because we're monitoring a spot very closely to make sure it's not, it's not changing. Yeah. Okay, one more scan question and then we'll move to monkeypox and on to COVID. Lindsay wants to know if you have a cardio scan at KU, does it pick up the lungs as part of the scan or is that a different test? I think that's a different test. Of it, it is a different test. In fact, uh, for the cardiac scan, which they're trying to pick up calcium in the coronary arteries, it's focal and localized around the heart. So we do capture a little bit of the lung that's surrounding, but uh, it is not an adequate screening test for lung cancer. It doesn't get to the periphery of the lung, although sometimes you do see some interesting things inside yeah. of the lung that makes you go do more work, but yeah. really it's not a good screening test yeah. for lung cancer. I lied. Rhonda just put in a good question. She says, Please. what if a person smokes cannabis daily? Is there a potential lung cancer concern? Yes. 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 Because, and, and partly that is, it's, it's, it's the combustion that you're going to inhale. And so the reality is it is. If you're in a vape all the time, that's a lung cancer concern. You know, it's a simple rule, actually. Your lungs don't like smoke or stuff that you inhale of any substance. And as a result, they can all cause problems with cancer. So 
I would just say uh, the, best, the, the best therapy here is to just say no. And I'd like to bring in some infectious disease too. Please. You know, we know and understand with uh, cannabis, with flower smoking, you can also have risk of aspergillus infection. And we have seen that here at our health system, especially in those people that are maybe immunosuppressed now because they're on uh, mm. chemotherapy or things like that. Aspergillus is a common fungus found in the environment, found on plants. And so when you inhale that, it doesn't really get burned or killed by the heat of, of that joint or whatever you might be smoking. So you have infection risk there as well. And Dr. Pai, because I remember when you and I first met a few years ago, you had hair on the top of your head and not on the bottom of your chin. <laughs> There's no chance that cannabis or smoking had any contribution to that, right? I am a lifetime, like you, I'm a lifetime non-smoker, and there is no cannabis contribution to this either. <laughs> <laughs> All right, excellent. Jill. Isaac wants to know that in July, it was said that in 95s, in respirator, respirators were required for the care of monkeypox mm -hmm. patients. Yeah. Um, and that monkeypox could be spread in mm -hmm. respiratory droplets. So why aren't we masking for monkeypox? Well, it could be spread in respiratory droplets, yes. talk, but it takes like three hours. Yes, you had a very good explanation of this. I think that's a great question. Um, we, do, we will be using care for any monkeypox patients here in the health system with N95 uh, or respirators, that's absolutely correct. You can spread it on respirato mm. respiratory droplets. It certainly can be spread, but just as Dr. Seitz said, it is much more difficult to spread it that way. You do need much more time, much closer contact as well. It is not spread really in that same vein as SARS-CoV-2 is when we're thinking about respiratory droplets. And so I would agree with you, Steve. Yeah, it takes three hours, but that's not a good three question. minutes. Yeah, yeah, it is a great question, Jill. Ying Lang is wanting to know, what is causing the surge of monkeypox cases in New York? Mm -hmm. Well, what I can tell you for sure is that um, of the, I don't know, is it 8,000 now or so cases in the world, and I think the U.S. is up to almost 5,000 maybe. Uh, I don't, I'm not. We report it so darn much. Yeah, we I'm not clear places, on that. Yeah. But what I think we need to continue to say is that 98% or more of those uh, current uh, patients that have, we have seen it, especially in the United States, are really it is that men who have sex with men group. And uh, we want to continue to put that information out there for everybody to be safe. Um, it is through a lot of uh, social networks like that, anonymous um, uh, interactions with each other. That is the main way that this is starting to be spread. And so we really need to continue to get that information out for everybody to understand, you know, what are the actions that you're doing, understand the people that you're doing them with, um, understand your risk of doing that. So that is what we are seeing, and that is the same thing in New York as well. And we know that San Francisco and New York has really mm -hmm. risen the alarm about that and really tried to get that information out there to keep everybody healthy. Uh, we are trying to do that as well. Um, understand that really the, the mode and spread of this disease is really through that close, intimate contact, that skin-to-skin -skin contact, but also clothing and bedding and other things that may have some of that drainage from some of those pustules on it. Do we offer the vaccine here? Right now, we do not. So we know that Health and Human Services, uh, the, the Biden administration is rolling out vaccine um, to the states. The supply is getting uh, better, but right now vaccination uh, in Kansas is really through KDHE. Um, so, but we are working on that. Hopefully there will be uh, easier access towards that. Jill. Yeah, let's wrap up with a few COVID questions. Jean wants to know, what do you know about the report that having COVID negatively affects the length of your life expectancy? Well, we know that to be yeah, true because uh, true. A, there's a lot of death associated with it. B, there is long COVID and other chronic syndromes. So life expectancy does go down. That's yeah. kind of a statistical exercise. Yeah, you know, I think that is completely true. And we have seen that since the big pandemic, there has been a number of epidemiologic studies and it truly does. We have seen the overall uh, life expectancy go down during the mm -hmm. pandemic. But even more, Steve, which you have really tried to champion and talk about a lot, we have continued to see more uh, social injustice during that pandemic as well, uh, especially around COVID and all of those things. So uh, there are quite a few uh, intricate details about all of this, but certainly we know that COVID and the pandemic in general has decreased life expectancy. Yeah, and people ask why if you have more economically challenging circumstances, yep. first of all, you're in an environment sometimes where people are living closer together. It's easier to transmit. Second of all, you got to go to work, and you can't zoom, mm -hmm. and you're trying. And, and so there are. And then you, if you lose your ability to be employed or you lose income, 
All of those things contribute, Mario, to a more difficult outcome for this country around COVID. Yeah, and I, I think it's not just economics, it's also access. Um, if care. you, uh, we were very interested in participating in the long COVID study because of our access to rural populations here in the state of Kansas and Missouri. And what we found out was that if you came from certain regions, uh, rural regions here in the state of Kansas, uh, your risk of dying from COVID was three times higher uh, than from urban areas. That's pretty striking and, and that striking, and, and that is certainly something that is a, a risk factor that we have started to recognize. It's not only socioeconomics, but it's also that access to care. It makes a difference. That's why we need Dr. Pike over that's there. That's right, Dr. Pike <laughs> yeah. out there taking good care of our patients out there in, in Great Bend. Joe Ellen is asking, what medicine do you have to stop taking if you go on Paxlovid? You know, you really don't. I think you need to talk with your medical provider who's ever ordering that drug for you. Um, even in those patients who are immunosuppressed, so we have, a very, uh, we have a lot of concerns about our transplant patients who are on immunosuppression because some of those drug-drug interactions. However, just understand that these are somewhat theoretical risks, but also understand the Paxlovid is for a very short period of time. So just talk with your medical team, those uh, pharmacists that are helping with that. You may have to reduce those risks, but you really shouldn't have to alter your medication regimen in general. Again, this is a very specific question for you as an individual, but in general, you shouldn't really have to stop um, too much. And again, it's a short course of therapy. It really should not impact anything too significantly, but just talk with your uh, medical team. And Gene wanted to clarify, he was talking about survivors of COVID, whether you have a mild or a strong mm -hmm. case, does it impact how long I might live? Uh, okay, that was more of a yeah, more question. Yeah, I think it still does. We, we mm -hmm. continue to see um, decrease in life expectancy. It does, but it can also uh, affect your quality of life, just as Dr. Castro talked about with long COVID and things of that nature, but also increasing your risk of other problems as well. We know that it can increase your risk of stroke later on. It can increase your risk of heart disease. Um, a recent published study in JAMA, uh, the JAMA network, also showed that those people that were vaccinated did much better, had less risk of things like ischemic stroke and heart attack um, if they were vaccinated. But those people that were unvaccinated had higher rates. So even vaccination, I want to pull that back in as well. Vaccination will help reduce those chances of, of having those complications as well. So at the end of the day, COVID is a bad disease mm -hmm. and you need to get vaccinated to stay safe from the disease. And when there's a higher amount of COVID, you don't to take more precautions. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Jill, that sounds like brand new. We've never said that before. Hmm. Right. Two questions on COVID and one lung question that just came in that I'm curious about, and then we got to cut it off. Um, Kathy wants to know, do you think someone is no longer contagious mm -hmm. if they still test positive two weeks later from taking Paxlovid? You know, generally that just means you're shedding virus yeah. and you're not positive unless you've got a really severe immunosuppressive illness, in which case you may still shed virus. Yeah, I think let's take the immunosuppressed out of it, Steve, because you bring up a very good point. So the people, have, uh, um, and I'm going to assume this question means if you are non-immunosuppressed, because I think we have to consider that, that that's a very good point from you. Um, yeah, I think, again, I think that the Biden issue really confused things. Um, and Fauci as well. Right, and Fauci as well with the rebound and then taking it again. But I think in general, and there are a lot of stories about this right now in the news media also. Um, in general, what we know and understand is that you really should not be testing again. The CDC guidelines say mm -hmm. don't test again. You can test, it, it is certainly in there as a possibility to do. Um, but really after about that first, uh, after about those 10 days, you should not be shedding any infectious virus at that point in time. So I understand this question. I, I think all these questions today have been really uh, on point and, and, and insightful. Uh, but really after that 10 days after that symptom onset, you shouldn't be shedding any more live virus. You should not really be testing again. The general public um, you know, doesn't really need to be testing again. That's currently not in, in the guidance. Um, obviously you can, but you shouldn't be shedding uh, live infectious virus, especially at that two week time point just like was, uh, was in the question. And remember that you don't test for live virus when you do your home test or your nasal PCR. You're testing for viral particles, different kinds. And yeah. uh, the answer is that you may well shed virus for weeks. Yeah, and, and so, I think that's a good point. Now, PCR, particles. we know you can be uh, it can be very sensitive and pick up just pieces of that RNA. Some people will say, well, if you are antigen positive, you are 
creating enough virus to be spread uh, to other people. But however, again, there's not a lot of recommendation to be doing that. And so I think after that 14 days, after that situation that we heard about in the question, you really shouldn't be shedding live virus at that point. Judy says that her husband has had COVID twice. Sorry to hear that. Yeah. Um, she has long COVID question. He seems mm -hmm. to have lost some of his temperature regulation ability. Mm -hmm. He's always cold no now. Very obvious change. Is yeah. this common? And the last time he caught COVID was a year ago. You know, we're seeing that, Hawkeye. I'm seeing some yeah. of my patients as yeah. well. Lots of long-term changes. And I think, Mario, you mentioned this earlier. Yet another problem we're seeing with long COVID is that loss of temperature regulation. You just don't feel right. Yeah, that's correct. I mean, there we classify this under the autonomic dysfunction yep. that that's can occur exactly. with long COVID, which means that there can be changes in how your body is sensing things in terms of temperature, um, nerve sensation, how your blood pressure fluctuates when you stand up and lightheadedness that, it, that can occur. Um, so this is exactly some of the things that we're testing for in the recover study is trying to figure out what's the appropriate test for, from your doctor and then what can we do about it. Okay, and my final, final COVID question, I'm sorry. I just, Kathy, she wants to get a second booster, but she got sick. Mm -hmm. And so she's like, I'm scared to get it. What would you tell her? You know, Hawkeye, you should still get that second booster. Oh, absolutely. You wait your six months and, and get it. You may be sick for a day, and after that, you bounce back pretty fast. Yeah, absolutely. Um, did she get COVID? Is that what the question was, Jill? No, she got the COVID booster, I think. She got the so. booster, and it made her oh. sick. Okay. Yeah, she absolutely. She wants to get another one, but she's afraid. Yeah, and, and what we have seen is that people who get the first series, even the first shot, their reaction may be different than with the second shot. That reaction can even be different with the third, which will be the first booster, uh, or the second. So just because you had reactions to one or two of the other doses doesn't mean you're going to have those same. We've seen um, uh, discontinuity as far as people who get symptoms after their doses. I would much prefer, you know, 24, 48 hours of some fevers or chills or something like that compared to the risk of actually getting the, well, the infection itself. And the long-term things of code, which we just heard from the prior viewer, yeah. who lost temperature control or taste mm -hmm. or I you understand that concern and or, I think it's valid, but yep. go ahead and get that booster. Okay, Sandra gets the last question and it is a lung cancer question and I don't know if I can say it, but why, why is 3B lung adenocarcinoma treatable but not curable? I think she's saying that she's seen people live with it for 10 years. Yeah, Mervis, that mm. this whole staging mm -hmm. of lung cancer, uh, it, it does impact. I mean, 3B is a little harder to treat than 3A, but people could still survive. Yeah, that's right. I think <clears throat> this really, <clears throat> excuse me, this really <clears throat> goes back to why lung cancer screening is so important. So if we detect the lung cancer early, like we talked about where we, you know, this, we're, we're finding lung cancer where it's just a small nodule, it's, it's located in one small area. Cure is an option, uh, and is and is uh, the expectation of treatment at that point. But unfortunately, once lung cancer is advanced, and what we're talking about in this instance is staging uh, 3B, which is is means that the lung cancer has spread to other areas of the body. And when this occurs, um, you know, unfortunately, often the the lung cancer is no longer curable. But with some of these personalized uh, gene-targeted therapies we discussed earlier, the cancer can often be uh, treated and, uh, you know, prevent, prevented from advancing or progressing for many, many years. So treatment can still be very effective, but unfortunately at that point, cure is often not uh, possible. Yeah, different times. All right, we're going to get final thoughts. I think Dr. Pike, are you still on the line? I'm still here. Excellent. Ben. Dr. Pike, first of all, thanks again for your great work in Great Bend. Any final thoughts from Great Bend? Um, I, I just want to reiterate my excitement to have a new CT scanner that's capable of the low-dose screening. I think that's going to be a game changer for patients and for the surrounding community that no longer have to travel to get the lung cancer screening done. And I look forward to um, helping them find find cancer and, and treat it before it becomes a more severe problem. All right, thank you. Dr. Hawkinson. 
Yeah, I think, again, I think very good, insightful questions about um, boosters, long COVID, all that today. You know, we are waiting for more information from boosters. Seems like the, the biggest uh, information will come probably in about six weeks or maybe in uh, four weeks, sometime in September about that. Uh, so we're hoping for that and we'll keep everybody updated. All right, Dr. Mermis. Well, hopefully uh, I'm a testament today uh, to uh, the power of vaccination and getting boosted and the fact that I'm, I'm doing okay uh, and uh, am, am not feeling too bad. And hopefully that's a good, a good example uh, to those out there still uh, wondering whether vaccination is right for them. That, you know, with vaccination, the majority of people are going to have mild symptoms uh, that aren't, aren't that severe and, and secondly, you know, we've talked a lot about lung cancer screening and the benefits of lung cancer screening. And hopefully uh, this session has really cleared up any questions people had about that. Help people identify those that are that are uh, that qualify for lung cancer screening and how with this uh, lung cancer screening, we can we can help save lives. At the end of the day, uh, smoking cessation is always still the way to go and the number one the number one way to to avoid cancer. And hopefully then not have to worry about about screening so yeah and thank you and i'm thanks for being on our program today and we make you uh, to, to god's be getting better quickly and feel good uh we'll check in with you during the week and make sure COVID 19 is staying at bay <laughs> dr castro well i just want to um, mention one other point that we haven't brought up about low dose screening is the hope is that we can detect early stages of lung cancer and um, there's actually a, a, a treatment trial that's going on here at, at KU Cancer Center where they're using an anti-cytokine therapy uh, in early stage lung cancer to see if that can help uh, prevent recurrence down the road. So um, I, again, I, I, there's a lot of advantages that um, coming to KU Cancer Center would give you that you would not have access elsewhere. And so I encourage you to go to that website and, and take a look at those trials and see if you could participate um, and, you know, still maintain your standard of care treatment with your oncologist, your lung cancer doctor, but still open up new doors of possibilities for you. Yeah, that's a big deal. Hey, you know, uh, Star Trek lost an icon this last week. Uh, on, on, um, Nichelle Nichols, who is Lieutenant Commander Uhura, Lieutenant Uhura, passed away uh, after 89 years of life. She was an outstanding character. She's one of the first African-American women, women, if not the first, to hold a position of command and respect on a, uh, a television show in the United States in the 1960s. She was a hero, and in many ways, what we're asking for all of you to do is also be a hero. Whether it's be to give te to testament about not smoking, following the rules of infection prevention and control, trying to keep our communities healthier and safer as we go through this pandemic, we need more heroes. We hope that we can all be like Star Trek and live long and prosper. Hey, tomorrow, it's been a year since we debuted the very first Open Mics with Dr. Stites. We're going to take you back to that first episode with guest Dr. Doug Gerard, the Chancellor at the University of Kansas. We'll see what our COVID numbers were like then compared to now. We you see you back live on Wednesday at 8. And remember, be a hero. 45,000 new cases of rectal cancer will be diagnosed this year, according to the American Cancer Society. On the next Open Mics, Dr. Seitz shows us the science behind a new treatment that made rectal cancer disappear in acute patients. The Remarkable Research, Wednesday at 8. Subscribe to our Morning Medical Update and Open Mics with Dr. Seitz podcast. Now, everywhere podcasts are available.